Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Finan 1 to 1 Introduction to Finance Week 10 Lecture. This is Frank, Frank Liu. The topic for today is risk and return. But before we go through risk and return, we're going to go through the final exam coverage as well as equity valuation part two, which is not examinable. All right. So risk and return tends to be one of the harder chapter. So please consider reading this week's slides at least four times. And given that everyone has access to the e-textbook now, which is available on Blackboard, um, the learnings material folder, there should be a link to the e-textbook. So please definitely consider reading this week's last slides as well as the textbook. All right, so we have the optional assignment, which starts from this morning, 10 a.m. on Monday, 11th of May, 2020. You have 14 days to complete it. Goes to 9.59 a.m. on Monday, 25th of May, 2020. This optional assignment covers contents in weeks one to nine. There are 15 questions. I think originally we said it's gonna be only uh, five attempts, but then why don't we just make it unlimited? So you have unlimited attempts until the due date and only the highest mark will be counted towards your final grade. Um, but given that, the reason why we call it optional because you have a choice. Um, so here is the total assessment structure that we went through in week six. Let me just repeat that again. So we now allocate 30% to my finance lab test. You have 11 tests. We're gonna take the best 10 out of 11. So it's roughly 3% each. And then for the remaining 70%, it's gonna be the maximum of the following two which is 10% optional assignment plus 60% final exam or 0% optional assignment plus 70% final exam. So it depends on how you do like in, in these two components. So if you achieve a higher percentage in final exam, then this 70% is gonna be just based on your final exam. But if you achieve higher percentage in optional assignment, which is very likely the case, given that you have a chance to get 100%, um, then yeah, then it will be 10% on optional assignment and remaining 60% goes to your final exam, right? So it's like usual, if you have any questions related to this uh, optional assignment, if you have questions, if you have like difficulties completing any question, couldn't get 100% of it, just let me know and put a question on the discussion forum. Please do not directly email me unless that's personal matters, because otherwise I was just gonna reply to you saying, please post it on discussion forum such that everyone can benefit from our discussion, right? Um, all right, so then comes to our final exam coverage. So the final exam is gonna be two hours. It's going to be an open book exam. So in the past that we, we, uh, we allow students to bring one A4 double-sided cheat sheet to the exam venue, but given that this year is gonna be done maybe at home, just in front of a computer on Examplifier, well, we saw oh, it's very difficult to check whether it's going to be two, one A4 or two A4, how many, how many cheat sheets that you have already prepared. We just decided to make it open book exam. So you can have whatever that's, you know, you can have whatever is available for you. Um, textbook, lecture slide, tutorial questions, past MFL test. Maybe you can print out some of this discussion on the discussion forum that just to help you understand. But it's going to be open book, right? So, um, so don't expect anything coming directly from your lecture slide. So I wouldn't ask you a sentence to say complete that sentence. That would be insane, right? But it's just going to be based on your understanding of the unit. Um, and I think it will be too late for you to go back to your lecture slides if you like in the exam venue. So probably you can think about the open book exam means that you don't have to memorize any formulas. You don't have to memorize any particular structures. But then, um, so, you know, when it comes to a question, I, you know, ask you to say, what was annuity, like, you know, ask you to get to calculate permanent value of annuity. So you can go back to us, to your lecture slide to say, okay, that, that is the formulas, right? Um, we have 45 questions. So 40 MCQ questions, multiple choice, and five short answers. Um, each MCQ question is two points, and each short answers is four points. So here on the bottom left corner, we give you out the exact decomposition of the question. So for the first 20 questions, uh, we have just only MCQ. You can think of it as just like a randomized MCQs coming from various chapters. In this case, will be chapters one to five, seven to 12. There is no chapter six MCQ questions. Um, and then 
And then we have six sections after the first 20. So you can see that we have 21, 23, 24, 25, and so on and so on. So you can think of it as just like each question was originally a like sort of like a long question with different components. But given that um, we can't get you to put input formulas here in the exam, so we just decompose each question into different parts that make them to be either MCQ or short answers. Um, to help you better, uh, to help you better prepare, you know, uh, for a more efficient uh, preparation for your exam. So here's the chapter distribution, right? Think about, you know, what is the best, uh, uh, best way to allocate your time in terms of preparation. So here you can see that on, on the right hand side, chapter one to two is roughly 6% in the final exam. So which means I just say, I never really understood chapter one or two, and I didn't understand any of this uh, sort of like accounting terms, the maximum marks you're gonna lose probably will be, I would say 6%, right? Even though there are some other chapters that would have this, that would have this concept based on chapter two. For example, your capital budgeting. So that's just a rough guide to tell you that um, here are, you know, um, chapter distribution. So you can see that three to five takes 22%, chapter six and seven, 12 and 14% each respectively. Eight to nine combined, 20%, 11 to 12, which is what we're gonna go to today, risk and return, as well as next week, portfolio theory, there'll be 26%. So they turn out to be one of the probably um, more important chapters. Um, I think this is the best I can do to decompose the exam for you. If you have any question, make sure you can make sure just ask one on discussion forum. But I just want to summarize that, summarize it. It's going to be open book, and I guess any calculator will be permitted because we, I, I don't think I can check what kind of calculator you have. So I'll probably just make whatever uh, calculator that you, that you have with you would be permittable. Uh, permitted. All right. So we're gonna come to a non -ex not example component. This is what we uh, what I promised in week seven when we go through the four first installment of stock valuation. So remember, in, in week seven, we went through uh, a very important, uh, very important model to, to price equity. Think about what we did. I know it's two weeks ago, right? We're using dividend discount model. So we're assuming that the companies. Well, at one stage, start paying dividends, and we think about as a shareholder, the shares that you're holding is equivalent to a uh, to an instrument that gives you the claim to future profitability of a firm, and that's how we price shares. And then we move on to say, okay, what if the company decide to do share repurchase, buy the shares back from its shareholders, and so we that's a total payout model. It's an extension of the dividend discount model. And then after you went through uh, capital budgeting with um, Daniel last week, that allows us to, to now introduce free cash flow, which is discounted free cash flow model, or some people would call it DCF, discounted cash flow. So here, if you, if you look at this table down, down, uh, down below, so if you, when you're looking at dividend payments, it determines the stock price because stock is, is like a security that allows you to receive dividends. And then when you're using total payout, that allows you to determine the equity because that means you're looking at the shareholders as a whole group. So dividends is one type of income. Share repurchase is also one type of income back to the shareholders because it buys shares back from shareholders. And the third one is the free cash flow. So you can think about like, you know, let's just say think, view Apple, right? We, I mean, everyone knows the company, Apple company, Apple Corp, and they make iPad, they make iPhones, they make MacBook, and they make all sorts of stuff, right? You can think about Apple, it's a combination of different projects, and each project generate cash flows. So which means that you can think of, you can think of when you va trying to value Apple the company, you can think about, I can value a whole bunch of different projects like what you did in capital budgeting. I'm gonna value a whole bunch of projects and in, in combine, they will tell me the total value of Apple. And that value will be, that value will be, the, will be able to generate cash flow to all its shareholders as well as his uh, debt holders, liability holders. So in this case, when you view Apple as a combination of different projects, 
like iPad and iPhone and stuff, that would determine the enterprise value. But how would that allow you to calculate share price? So you may, you may remember that in week two, when we went through a whole bunch of accounting terms, we introduced enterprise value, the value of the company. So the enterprise value is market value of equity plus debt and minus cash. So here, the reason why it's plus debt and minus cash is to think about it. Is let's say if I want to take over a company, I have to buy all its shares so I can claim 100% ownership. But then on top of that, I also need to make sure I have enough money to pay all the debts or the loans that is currently owing. Which means I need to, on top of my budget, you know, I, you know, I need to make sure that all the shareholders are happy, I buy all the shares, and then I will need to pay off pay off all the loans. But once I take control of the company, I will have the cash. I will be able to claim the cash that the company has. So which means that I can minus the cash amount such that that's something that you know you know I'm gonna have. So which means I'm gonna minus the cash amount to, to think about how much money should I prepare to buy the company. So that roughly explains this formula enterprise value equals to market value of equity plus debt minus cash. So which means if you think about Apple as a whole bunch of project add up together, which gives you enterprise value, then it's very straightforward to work out what the share price is. If you just rearrange the formula, um, if you rearrange the formula, which is like here down in the bottom, price equals to the enterprise value plus cash minus that divided by shares outstanding, right? Um, which is what you see over here, because if you rearrange the formulas, you get market value of equity equals to enterprise value plus cash minus that. And in order to calculate share price, you need to scale that by a number of shares together. Right. So that gives you a rough idea. Remember, this is not an example. I just want to introduce this concept to you. So you have that in the background of your knowledge. And when you come to, um, uh, valuation unit in the future in finance, then you know, then you, then at least you, then at least you know the rough idea about what that is. So when we come to this this key formula and you know and and leveraging on what you learn in capital budgeting. So when you think about a firm is a is combination of a whole bunch of projects, and when you evaluate one project, it goes to find free cash flow first, to and then calculate the present value or net present value of that. So in this case, so which means that the problem will really simplify down to, okay, I'm gonna estimate the free cash flow for each of the project. Like let's say if for iPhone, I'm gonna estimate its sales value, uh, sales revenue and the cost associated with selling iPhone, and then, uh, and then make a projection about, you know, what is the sales revenue gonna be for iPhone 11, 11 Pro. I'm sure the iPhone 12 is gonna come up this year. So which means I'm gonna do the valuation of that again. But you can think of that it's just going to be, a, you know, a summation of all these different projects add up together, right? So, which means that is not that different from what you're already seeing in capital budgeting. So, once you work that out, that gives you V0, which is the enterprise value. So, you know, then you calculate share price, which is just going to be V0 plus cash minus that divided by shares outstanding. That gives you the share price. All right, so I'm not gonna go to go through this in details, but you would just have you would just say, okay, that is how it's linked to capital budgeting. Think about a firm as a combination of different projects together, which is probably tell you why a firm needs to take positive MPV project. All right, so here I have an example. Um, read that in your own time. Of course, you can read chapter ten, given that you have access to a textbook now. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, limitation of the F, uh, free cash flow model or DCF model. So as for the dividend discount model, the valuation is very sensitive to the assumption made. In particular, the bulk of the valuation coming from your assumption, sorry, I have to go back to the previous slide, um, it goes to your assumption on this VN, which means, let's just say, when the project's gonna be mature in, in five years time, and now I'm gonna start assuming it will form a perpetuity, right? Or maybe a perpetuity with, with constant growing rate. And that VN here 
it probably takes the majority of the proportion of v0. So which means that the you know your v0 will be very sensitive to um, to the VN to say which year that would mature uh, that project would become mature, and this is something that that you probably would take notice when you start doing your own F, uh, discount cash flow model in your future unit. So it's so which means that given that you know it's based so given that a bulk of the um, the value coming from that assumption, so it's it's probably natural for you to do sensitivity analysis and scenario analysis, which I which I believe is what went through last week in capital budgeting. If not, um, sen sensitive analysis just means that I change one variable at a time, holding everything else constant, and to think about how my net present value at the end will be will be responding to my changing of one assumption. A scenario analysis, which means that it, it means that when I'm holding more than one variable, or we, which uh, I'm, hold, I'm changing more than one variable at a time. So I'm changing two variables at a time, holding everything else constant, and come out with a scenario. For example, like, you know, when, when in a mo uh, economic downturn, the price gone down as well as the demand goes down. So which means when I have two changes in, we have to, uh, we have changing two variables, and how would my MPV respond to that? So it's, so it's, it's it's very important for you to do the sensitivity analysis and scenario analysis to give an idea that in what scenarios would your MPV is still going to be positive, right? So no one's going to believe just a single number. No, I mean you can't just report to say I think the MPV is going to be ten million dollars, given this assumption. Your boss is not going to believe you. They'll say, "Okay, show me how sensitive it is to um, to the um, the perpetuity growth rate." Right? That would be one example. All right. The second method people use is valuation based on comparable firms. So just like DCF, the valuation based on comparable firms also looking at the firm as a whole. Which means so the basic idea is to think about okay, is think about a firm must has its close peers. And we can say that is probably very it probably very similar to its close peer, or maybe exactly exactly the same. Maybe it's, it's uh, maybe because I just say when you think about uh, Samsung, right? Samsung makes phones, Samsung makes laptops, and um, maybe you could say in some way it's very similar to Apple, in some way very similar to Huawei, some way very similar to LG. And um, so which means that I can just think about using a few uh, financial ratios that you learn from um, from week two to think about maybe that ratio can give me a quick idea of what the company is. It's, this is particularly relevant when you're trying to value a, a private company. I just say here I have a company that does everything the same as what Uber does. Right? It also offers share ride and it has very similar business structure but this company is not listed. But Uber is listed. So which means that I can observe share price for Uber. I can I can see all the accounting information based on Uber. So I can I can draw I can draw a extrapolation based on what Uber has, and I can say maybe based on a few key ratios, what would what would the price be for these um, private firms? That's the rough idea. But but because there's whole, so many ratios that you can consider, um, we're just gonna talk about one very popular ratio, which is the price earning ratio. So the price earning ratio is the share price divided by its earnings per share, like profitability. Um, you can think about okay, as, because it's not example, we're not gonna, not gonna spend too much time on comparing trailing P and forward P. But the idea here is that let's just say if I know the P ratio for that company is five, and let's just say for that five, and I would say that company B will be similar to company A, so that means you would have share the same P ratio five. Then given the earnings of company B, I can calculate the share price for company B, right? That's the idea. So you can see from um, so here I have you know I have a few examples um, oh, that just sort of going through some details about how you uh, how you can interpret for a big PE. But here we have an example Best Buy. So let's just say Best Buy has uh, earnings per share earnings two point five three dollars per share. And say let's just say it has a whole bunch of comparable firms. The trailing P for the stock is nineteen point three. Then what we're essentially doing here is that one way is that we can make assumption saying uh, Best Buy has the same P E ratio as is as the average P E ratio of its comparable companies. So based on the earnings of two point five three, 
and based on the assumed PE ratio, we can calculate the share price to be 48.83. So you can see here, I would say this is pretty uh, quick and dirty, like everybody use it just to, to, to give you a, to give you an idea about how close the current price is to its peers, right? Um, you know, um, but you know, just, just like everything else, there were so many limitations because there's no clear guidance on how to adjust for the difference. And it doesn't really take taking taking uh, taking account that what if the company is, is gonna have a very different growth trajectory to its peers, right? I mean, even though we say Apple and Samsung is very similar, but then maybe in the future, they couldn't be more different, right? So which means that when you're trying to use or whatever you have for Apple, as a reference for, for Samsung, you may end up with a very, you know, you may, you, may, you may end up with a wrong number given that a share price has to be forward looking. Because share price, after all, it gives you the claim to its future earning ability, not what happened in the past, right? All right, so that, that, that's, that's probably the quickest. Uh, description of the um, share validation two part two that I can have and I do encourage to read chapter 10 if you can but I just want to make sure that you know that chapter 10 is not example we're not gonna ask you discounted cash flow model for share price valuation um, that's just some background it's just some knowledge it's sort of like a bonus knowledge All right now we come to um, chapter 11 which is the, our topic 10 risk and return so just give you a note that our lecture slides actually covers slightly more concept than the textbook. Um, and here's the typo, the tutorials will be held in week 11, not week 12, sorry. So that would be week 11. So we have three questions from the textbook and three extra questions that I wrote. Um, and here is the due dates for my finance lab test, eight, nine, and 10, which is due this Friday, next Friday, and Friday is in two weeks time, right? Um, there should be, uh, you know, I would say uh, the MFL test 10 for risk and return. The test itself is quite reasonable. In terms of calculation, it's actually very straightforward. What, what is difficult is the concept. All right, here I have a special note. Um, so for this week's, you can see that there are a few slides that have a heading that is um, sort of green heading, green heading with white writing. So, and then it, th there will be, um, there will be a, a, a thing there, background knowledge. So the background knowledge really here is that, well, the formulas are introduced to help us understand the concept of risk and return. But you are required to learn how to use these formulas to calculate expected and realized portfolio return and variance, but you shouldn't worry too much beyond just calculate return and variance. And we're probably not gonna ask you anything crazy about, you know, you wouldn't spend more than one minute to calculate them, right? So these are background knowledge, and um, but it's definitely worthwhile for you to read chapter 11. I think that's covering 11.1. .1. And the concept introduced this week actually look harder than the corresponding computational type questions. But the key here, is that it's, you know, um, so I can teach this uh, risk and return in a finance PhD level unit. I can probably gonna go through that in six hours with different um, different journals and different model matrix uh, derivation. But I can also go through in what we have here. So the, the concept is actually quite important. So I would say that is that the key here you know, despite all the graphs, despite all the formulas, and the key here is to understand a bigger picture, what should the relationship of risk and return be? So there are two key themes in this unit. The first one is time. The second one is risk, right? So time, you know that, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna get cash flows in the future. We can't really move the cash flow in year three back to year zero, but in week three, and we, we went through that, you know, um, to the law of one price in the normal market, we can find an equivalent value through an intermediary like a bank that such that we can actually move our cash flow in year three to year zero to find an equivalent value. Even though we can't physically move the cash flow back, but we can do it on conceptual level and that can be done, right? So that's the first theme of time. And you know that time generates interest. Time has a value measured in dollars. The second biggest theme in our unit is risk, right? So, and that's what we're gonna go through today, risk and return. Here are a whole bunch of learning objectives. So um, 
make sure you go through them and they will be shared with week tw uh, week 11 lecture as well so we've been looking at pricing of real finance real and financial asset so essential theme here is that okay we don't have arbitrage opportunity if there is arbitrage opportunity someone's going to take over it which means that when you see the price uh, you can buy and sell that price over there so and then we can apply the law of one price and then but when you're applying law of one price well it has to be or it has to be same asset or asset with very similar level of risk so which means uh, you know I, I mean in real life I can't really directly compare of of lending money to the government to lending money to a company right it's, that's essentially what we went through in, in week six right when you're talking about bonds talking about corporate bonds right because I know it's a lot safer to lend money to the government because after all government can put pressures on the reserve bank and they can they can print more money out so essentially that they, they will pay out his his obligation but for a company there is a chance for them to default so which means that in this case I know that when I compare different project I have, I have to incorporate a factor called risk right so in this case the, the natural question here is that how can we measure risk and how can we use the measure to compute required rate of re required return because you may you, you may notice that in week seven we use our for uh, require equity required rate of return we, we, you know, we already mentioned that a company may default, they may not pay you dividends, your cash flows that you generate are not, are not certain. So in this case, what do we need here? We need a theory of risk and return. What is the relationship? All right. So you may pause the video now to think about what is your intuition about a relationship between risk and return? All right, you may remember that is some people saying high risk, high return, high rewards. But is that always the case? You like you're gonna uh, you will get you will get high return from high risk. I just give you a quick example. I just say I'm not encouraging encouraging to do that. But I just say if you go to George Street and to just say if you're gonna rob uh, St George Bank, right? I'm just just a random bank, right? Just just rob St George Bank. It's we probably all agree it's very, it's a very highly risky activity. But can, do you think you can get much cash out of it? Do you think St. George Bank, that branch, would have a lot of cash? Probably not. So here, you just saying, okay, we probably know there, was, there is a rough, you know, rough direction, higher risk, higher return, but not always the case. So how can we define the, you know, academically or empirically, really, what is the relationship between risk and return? So let's have a look at this figure. Okay, it's a very important figure. Um, so here, the idea of this graph is to show you that, let's say back in 1925, someone, or say your great-great-grandfather, uh, um, putting $100 in, in a following investment. So let's, let's, let's have a look at what kind of investment he has. So CPI here, so CPI is the inflation rate. So you can think about that's just like, that, that is what the nominal amount is going to grow up to. Treasury bills is what is like a short-term loan made by the government. treasury bills corporate bonds that's what the bond issued by a company what portfolio what portfolio is like it's like a it's like a synthetic portfolio it doesn't exist right but it's like a synthetic portfolio invested in the whole world equity market s p 500 that is the standard and poor finder that is based on the top 500 uh, companies listed in us the composition of that changes every, you know, pretty much every year. But that, but that is equivalent of saying I'm gonna invest in 500 of the biggest companies in U.S. Right? They tend to be the bigger ones, not a, not the biggest in, in the world, but the, 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 the one that listed in U.S. market. And small stocks portfolio, you can think about is just it fits into a particular definition. Small stocks in the world. So here, let's just say if you're putting $100 in back in 1925. What can you get? So over here, that shows you roughly uh, at, by the time 2012, if you put money in $100 in CPI, and you will get 1,261. And the biggest one is, probably you can tell me, or you can tell me in your head, the biggest one, the biggest one, the one I had give, give, give you the biggest return is the small stocks. That's right, the red one. 
$2.655 million. That's what $100 can give you if you invest in that synthetic portfolio. I mean, what does that tell you? So you probably would say, okay, CPI is, is just an exposed measure of the price uh, index, inflation, treasury bills. I mean, you would say, okay, which one is the safest? By safe, I mean, if you look at the trajectory, it's very smooth. There's no bumps. There's no peaks and troughs. Which one will be the safest? You probably would be either CPI or treasury bills, right? Because they're just really smooth if you're looking at, if you're looking at the trajectory. It's just going up, up, up. There it really isn't anything going down. So I just say uh, treasury bills, right? That's pre and, and CPI that's the safest. Which one is which one has the highest risk? Which one has the the hot the, the largest number of bumps? Probably small stocks. If you look at it, um, just after three years you holding the portfolio. It went down by 92% during the 1929 um, financial crisis, recession, right? And then did again in 1937, went down by 72%. And 1968, it went down by 63%. So which means that, let's say if you, if you indeed, if you were holding this portfolio of small stocks, you probably have like million heart attacks along the way. But guess what? That one gives you the highest return. The small stocks portfolio gives you the highest return. So based on this graph, what we can say here is that remember finance is like a unit that draws a, draws a theory coming from the empiricals, coming from what we observe, right? It's not like a rocket science that tells you, you know, what they, you know, how a missile should fly, right? But here it's based on what we observe. So what we observe in the past is that it looks like there is a positive relationship between risk and return. So here, the one that has the lowest risk, CPI and trash abuse, they give you the lowest return, right? But the one that with higher risk, in particular, small stocks, the one that probably generate the highest risk, highest uncertainty. We haven't really defined what risk is, but you can see that it's just a lot of bumps here, a lot of peaks and troll, lots of, you know, lots of uh, nervousness would be small stocks. So here, based on this empirical observation, we can say, you know, the relationship between risk and return is positive. The higher the risk, higher return, and the lowest risk, the lower the return, right? The lower the risk, the lower return. I mean, if you can get that point, if you can get, get that point, then you probably can, I, I wouldn't say, I would encourage you to skip this lecture because there's more, uh, there's, there, there's more to it, right? But that gives you an idea. So what's, you know, what's gonna follow is to, officially derive that, officially show that to you, here we have a high, high risk, high return relationship, which means there's a positive relationship between risk, risk and return. The summary is given in the next slide. So here we, 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 you know, we see that small stocks had the highest long-term returns while T-bills had the lowest long-term returns, you know, in all the risky, uh, activ risk, risky investments. And small stocks had the largest fluctuations in price, while T bills had the lowest, apart from, you know, apart from CPI. So CPI here really isn't an actual investment. And so over eighty plus years, we see that high risk receive a high return. So which means that we know that there is a positive relationship between risk and return. But you know, but how much return for a unit of risk, and how do we define risk? And so we already mentioned that these are portfolios, even though we haven't really officially introduced you the concept of portfolio, but would that relationship hold for individual asset? Which means, do I also see that for on a company level, that's, let's say if company A is ha, generate a higher risk than company B, does company A give you a better return? Do we see that? All right, this is what we're gonna, this is what we're gonna find out. So common measures of risk and return. So if you want to understand about the, you know, the, the relationship between risk and return, we need to introduce a few um, concepts from stats. So the first one is the probability distribution. So when an investment is risky, we mean that it will generate different outcomes under different scenarios. 
So there are different returns you may earn. Each possible return has some likelihood of occurring. And so we, let's just say if I have an, let's just say if you're rolling a dice, let's just say if, if I get, uh, if I get one, then I will get paid $10. If I roll out two, I'll get paid $20. And if I roll six, I get paid $6. You can say rolling the dice can be a can be you know can can generate you variable different outcomes because it depends on what you're gonna roll out you will get different you know different payments so which means in this case we can say that that could be a risky one and um so what we have here is that the first background knowledge we want to want to introduce is the expected return or also known as mean. Expected return is calculated as a weighted average of the possible returns where the weight correspond to the probabilities. So if some of you have uh, did this in your, in your high school, you probably already know all the notation. And if you're currently doing some stats or econometric unit, you probably also recognize this, this one. And if you haven't, don't worry about it. So we're just gonna introduce this as expected return, expected what you expect to get on average is um, is represented by E and bracket R, R stand for return. And that can be calculated as a summation of the probability for each outcome times what the outcome will give you. So in this case, um, let's just say, uh, let's, let's say come back to the example of BFI stock. Let's just say BFI stock currently trades for $100, $100 per share. So if you want to buy one, it would take you $100. In one year's time, there's going to be three outcomes. The first outcome is that there's a 25% chance the share price will be 140, a 50% chance will be 110, and 25% chance it will be 80. So you can see that it's going to be going up by $40, or going up a little bit by $10, or going down by 20, right? So in this scenario, so if you want to calculate the expected return, just remember here we're not calculating the expected share price, we're calculating the expected return. So the expected return, so let's just say in scenario one, when it goes to 140, what is, what is the return? So that will be the return here, if you re remember what we talked about in week seven, return will be P1 over P0 minus one. So the end value divided by the initial value minus one. Right, that's the return. So in this case, in scenario one, the return is 40%. Scenario two is 10% return with 50% chance. And scenario three is go down by 20% with 25% chance. So the expected return of BFI will be each outcome multiplied by the probability. That's why we have this uh, summation here, 25% chance times minus 0.2 plus 50% times 0.1 plus 25% times 0.4 gives you 10%. And I think this is probably if that if that if that does come up in the exam, you, you probably wouldn't expect to have more than three outcomes. Right? So so that means that on average you will generate you 10% return on average. And variance. So variance here is another statistic term which, which measures the dispersion. Uh, and variance is heavily used um, in finance industry as a measure for risk. Um, so here, we're gonna talk about what, which risk term that variance will be related to later. But just for the calculation, it looks, bit, it looks slightly more complicated. So the variance is equal to a summation of the probability of the particular event times the return in that event minus the expected return in that event and then square, right? So if you have, have seen this, you say, okay, this is, you know, this is just a formula. If you haven't seen this, you maybe feel, feel like, oh, you are, don't be intimidated. I mean, it looks difficult, but it's actually not, all right? And associated concept with variance is standard deviation, which is the square root of variance. So SD, we probably see that term a lot, standard deviation. SD equals to a square root of the variance. And standard deviation is also known as volatility. So when people talk about volatility, they refer to standard deviation or they're referring to the square root of variance, right? So both are measures of risk of a, of a probability distribution. 
And when you're doing some advanced unit in finance and economics, you probably will come across the term called skewness and ketosis. There are also measures, there are also uh, measures that describe the probability dense, uh, probability distribution. Right? We're not going to go to skewness and ketosis here, so don't worry about it. So for for that same example, BFI stock, how do we how do we apply the variance formula? So the variance and standard deviation here, so the variance equals the probability multiplied by the return of the particular scenario minus 0.1. And 0.1 here comes from the expected return that we calculate, right? So we calculate expected return of BFI as 10%. That's what you get on average. And then the formula requires us to put in the probability, probability times the return for a particular scenario minus the expected return of this stock, right? And then square. So for BFI, the variance, it looks long, but just gonna be following the formula, 25% times minus 0 0.2 minus 0 0.1 squared plus blah, 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 you get 0 0.045. And the standard deviation of that is the square root of variance which gives you 21.2%. So um, in finance, the standard deviation of return is also referred to, to as is volatility. And people like comparing volatility or people like quoting volatility because volatility is a number that can be is easier to interpret because variance here is a squared term over there, right? So which is pretty what you can think about why people want to introduce standard deviation is to take get rid of that square effect is take a square root of it to give you so 21.2 percent that's in the same unit as return so okay here is just some again there's some background knowledge you don't have to know is that what is the function of the square doing in variance the rough you know the you know the i mean the rough idea of of doing a square of the variance is that you actually penalize the deviation from a mean on either side. So let's just say if you're gonna generate a lower mean than the average, it's gonna be a penalty because that is getting a, getting a smaller return than what you expect. But in addition, you also penalize the upper side, which is, for example, 0 0.4 here, because 0 0.4 means you are gonna get 40%, better than what I expect to be 10%. But that's also a deviation, right? That, that is also deviating from what you expect to get. So so the, so here, um, so the square term here is just get rid of the sign. So I'm gonna just gonna measure dispersion on either side, right? If that confuses you, don't worry about it. Just skip it and uh, go to the next slide. Uh, also, as a background knowledge, so a um, a normal distribution. So the normal distribution is quite heavily used in finance. We, we assume, in some cases, we assume market returns follow a normal distribution. So a, what does a normal distribution mean? A normal distribution here has a very important feature, among many other features, is that about 95% of all possible outcomes fall within two standard deviations above or below the A average. And this is known as the 95% prediction interval, which is average or mean plus or minus two times standard deviation and another known feature with the normal distribution means that is 67 percent of all possible outcomes fall within one standard deviation above or below the average about two-thirds so which means when someone tells you something falls into a normal distribution and tells you the mean of it say 10 percent and standard deviation of it, say 21%, then you can quickly form a, uh, a guideline in your head to say, okay, if that is the mean, that is the standard deviation, then I, I know that 95% chance, you're gonna fall into a range. And two thirds of the chance, you're gonna fall into a, of course, a narrow range. That give me an idea about, you know, what kind of possible outcomes I'm gonna get and what's the likelihood of getting it, right? And then anything falls beyond it will be a, what you call a tail event. 5% chance. All right, here is um, coming from your textbook. So uh, let's describe the normal distribution. So um, I, yeah, you could just read that in your own time, but I just give you a quick way 
to show you based on what I know about the mean and standard deviation, I can come up with just a rough idea about, I just say here, given this, this, this distribution, I know that the chance for this stock to give me, say, negative 70% chance, sorry, negative 70% return, has a very small chance. Why? Because the bulk of it in the middle tells you that's what's gonna happen 95% chance. So which means anything not shaded, anything beyond the shaded area will be in that 5% event with five percent event window. So which means for this particular stock, the chance that I'm gonna get a negative 70% return will be quite small. All right? Let's just give you an idea. Okay, so that's just a background knowledge to tell you about, okay, if I, if I knew the uh, return distribution for a particular stock, I can then measure the expected return for the stock, I can measure the, uh, the variance related to the stock, and that's, then that's it, right? But in real life, in this subject, we do not know the distribution. We don't know what Apple is gonna be like next year. Right, even though as big as Microsoft and Microsoft, which is one of the, which is not one of the biggest company, the most valuable companies in the world, we don't know what that, we don't know what the return is going to be next year. We do not know the return distribution for any company, for any investment. We don't know. If someone claims that they know, they are lying, right? But what we can do here in finance is like, you know, we are good at making assumptions. So our our starting point here, our first assumption we're going to make, we expect the future to be very similar to the past, such that in the past, we can observe what happened in the past, and we can collect information, gathering data, and you know, that's probably what financial analysts do, we, we gathering data, we, we, we show you what was the historical mean, and what is the historical standard deviation, and based on that, maybe we can draw inference on what's happened in the future, right? So which means that requires us to know how do we calculate historical return and how do we calculate historical standard deviation. So historical return is also known as realized return. So it's a return that actually occurs over a particular time period. So remember in week seven, we went through return, we define it as because when you're holding a share, right, you're gonna get dividend, you're gonna get um, you're, you're gonna get a higher share price, capital gain rate, or lower share price, different share price. So the return in that case, which is gonna be dividend yield plus capital gain rate, right? Remember, take dividend yield, which is D1 divided by P0, capital gain rate, which is P1 minus P0 over P0, right? So here the return coming from two parts, and the, that return is what we call realized return because that's what we observe. And so, and here's another assumption that we make is that, you know, when people receive dividends, some people choose to cash it out and to spend it, to buy a new computer, buy a car, or just to pay for a bill, right? But some other person, some other investor would just say, okay, I'm gonna reinvest my dividend into buying more stocks, which is a reasonable assumption. So here, just for calculation purpose, Really, this is really just for calculation purpose. We're not assuming everyone's doing it, but it just makes our life easier to actually calculate return. So what we're saying here is that if the, if you get paid stock, get paid stock dividends, then we assume all dividends are immediately reinvested and used to repurchase, sorry, purchase additional shares of the same stock. And if you can think about it, is that let's say if a stock pays dividends at the end of each quarter, so you would have a realized return of for quarter one, realized return for quarter two, realized return for quarter three and quarter four, then you can think about that the whole return that you get for the year can be computed as a combination, the product of the four returns. Because when we get paid dividends, we will reinvest dividend buying more shares. So you can think about that just like, if, you, if I get paid 2% dividends, 2% of the current um, share price, then I will just reinvest to the share such that my share portfolio will go up by 2%, right? That's just like a return. So in this case, we can have, we can calculate our annual return in such a way, 
right? It's just easy for calculation, for calculation purpose. We're not saying everyone is actually reinvesting dividend to buy shares in real life, but just saying for calculation purpose, when you get paid dividend, we just think about you buying more shares of the same company with these dividends, such that it will translate into a number, a return number that we can easily compare with, right? So in real life, you probably, you know, you would know ASX 200 index. We also have an ASX 200 accumulation index. And that one, the accumulation, when, whenever you see a term accumulation index, that just means assuming when the underlying uh, company, let's just say one of the portfolio company in the top 200, when they get paid dividends, they will reinvest the dividends to buy more shares. So then you would have a price index, you know, normal ASX 200, and then you also have an accumulation index, which assuming that the dividend income will be used to regenerate, to buy more shares. You can see that it looks slightly different. The reason why is because one of them assuming you'll, you'll, you'll be keep, you, will, you still keep the money with the company, such that when you get paid dividend in the first quarter, you buy more shares, and that allows you to have higher return in the second quarter because higher number of shares will give you higher amount of dividends, right? That's just the way how we calculate company return in that way. All right, just to give you an example. So here, let's just say, looking at Microsoft, I don't have a question here, but you know, it, here is just, you know, uh, the, the important bit of this slide is to looking at how we actually calculate um, the return. So let's just say here is Microsoft. So um, if you're focusing on uh, this window over here, so that is August 23rd, 2004, the share price was 27.24, the dividend was 0.08, and the return you're gonna get, that return corresponding to the holding period between December 31st, 2003 to August 23rd, 2004, right? Why eight months? Well, the eight months is because um, Microsoft didn't pay any dividends until August 23rd, right? So let's just say, okay, for that period, for that eight months period, what is the return? The return will be the eight cents dividend plus 27.24 divided by the initial price, which is 27.37 minus one. That tells you if you're holding that share for about eight months, uh, considering the dividend that you get, uh, the return was minus 18, 18 basis point. And um, you can do the same for uh, for November, they pay another dividend, uh, and then you can do the same for 12 um, December the 31st, 2004, again. So you get a return. So you get a return which is 11.86% for uh, for this three months period between August and November, and you get minus 2.45% between November and December. So that means the return, you're holding the um, Microsoft return, holding for a year, would be a plus three. So one plus minus 0.18% times one plus 11.86% times one minus 2.45%, minus one. So that tells you that the return you get from that stock in that year is 8.92%. So in this case, the assumption of dividend reinvestment just make this calculation more easier. It's just to say, okay, I know you get paid dividend, but when I'm, if I want to calculate the return for the whole year, it's a lot easier for me to assume that when you get paid dividend, you reinvest to the share such that um, I will be able to calculate the, the return for the whole year. So for 2004, 8.92%. 2008 is minus 44.39%. I think it's the actual figure. You would go, geez, what happened in 2008? Well, probably you can tell me what happened in 2008. Uh, if in particular, in the fourth quarter, right, the share price went down by 27.71%, right? Probably you can tell me what happened that year. Uh, hint, global financial crisis, right? So anyway, this, this example demonstrates how, how you can calculate share returns for a company based on the realized information and we care about a yearly number because again, it's just it's just low. Remember how we when we talk about interest rate conversion back in week five, we talk about people like to think about an annual term. 
So in annual term, the return for Microsoft in 2004 was 8.92, 2008 was minus 44.39%, right? Okay, and of course, once you learn how to do one, it's not hard for you to program it to calculate everything else, right? This is just, so if you use Python or if you use R, SAS, Stata, Excel, even Excel, or anything, or anything that you prefer, C++. If you, I mean, once you work work out the formula, the algorithm to, to calculate one, you can do that for everything else. So let's just say here, let's just say if you if you actually if you collect the data, you went ahead and you calculate for S and P five hundred realized return. You calculate the Microsoft realized return. You calculate the one month TBO return. That's the information that we have, right? Saying that, I mean, here. Um, Here's an exercise, right? You can calculate all that return. And what we're trying to draw here is the next bit. He said, uh, okay, I'm gonna calculate all this for all the US large stocks, annual returns between 1926 to 2011. So this one only gives you an example between 2001 and 20, 2011. But of course, you can extend a period as long as you have the price information, right? As long as your dividend information, you can cal calculate the realized return for everything, right? So, so let's just say you have you have all the price information, all the dividend information. You have so you go ahead and calculate the returns for S and P five hundred, for all the small stocks, for all the corporate bonds, and for all the one month treasury bills. So and in this case, you calculate the yearly information between nineteen twenty six to twenty eleven. So once you have that, that means I have many different numbers, right? So so in this case. For this over this um, 12 year period i mean 11 year period i have 10 different return number right you can say okay i mean um for microsoft for example the the return range between minus 44.4 percent the lowest to say the highest 60.5 percent right so and then you can draw this number out so let's just say i'm gonna plot it i'm gonna make a distribution just like how you know when you see a distribution for your exam, right? You can think about what is the highest mark um, someone got, what is the lowest mark someone got, and sorry, uh, so, you know, and what is the average for the whole class, and what is the median for the whole class, and all, so on, so on. So if you plot that, and you have this graph, you can it, that so so um, and this is just one way to do to plot in, uh, the distribution. So on the x-axis, that is the return range between minus 60 percent to 100 percent and on the y-axis that's just the frequency how many times does that fall into that particular bin and that looks like between zero to five percent five to ten ten to fifteen fifteen to 12, twenty so that's so what, what how many years does it fall into a particular bin so in this case the green color is the one month treasury bills triple a which is very very safe Comparing to double A or A, that's, that's, that's probably the safest corporate bonds that you can you can you can buy. And then the blue one is the S and P five hundred, and the red one is the small stocks. So what conclusion can you draw if you stare at this graph? Small stocks has probably the widest dispersion, right? It ranges between minus fifty five percent to about above hundred percent. Where in comparison, the one month treasure bills is just concentrate in the middle. So, which means that gives you an idea that are we able to use dispersion as a proxy for risk? So here you can tell. So your intuition tells you the uh, you know the, we know that small stocks was the the one that uh, has the highest risk in the previous graph, and also you know you confirm with that confirm with that observation in this graph that when you plot out a return distribution it also has the widest dispersion and in this case when you plot out distribution the dis sorry when you plot out the, the distribution dispersion can be measured using standard deviation or variance so that gives you an idea okay maybe we can use that as a proxy risk so Oh, that's just a, another background knowledge to calculate average annual return. So how do we calculate? So, you know, what can we get out of this previous graph, previous distribution? 
So we can calculate, well, first of all, we can calculate the average return. So the average return we calculate based on X number of years will be small stocks gives you 18.7% between 1926 and 2011. So out of that many yearly observations, small stocks give you the highest return. The next one is S&P 500, 11.7%, corporate bonds, 6.6% on average, and trash abuse, 3.6%. So this confirms what our previous observation, trash abuse give you the lowest return, small stocks give you the highest return. And then we can also calculate the um, realized variance and realized uh, standard deviation. So to calculate variance using realized return, so we use this formula here, var r equals to one over t minus one times the summation of rt minus r bar, which is the average return square. So if you want to draw a comparison with the variance formula we have over here, so if you know the probability distribution, it will be a summation of the probability times return minus expected return square. But when you don't know the distribution, so which means when you don't know the distribution, you don't know what the probability associated with, with each event, then one way for us to make assumption is that we're just going to assume, I mean here we define, we define our each observation is as likely as another. So which means if I have 50 years of observation, I would say each observation is as likely as the others. That's just definition. We, we calculate var uh, realized return, uh, realized variance. But then you have one, mon one over t minus one here. So um, without going through too much of statistics terms, the t minus one here, the minus one here, is you're losing one degree of freedom because you don't know what a true mean is. So you, you need one degree of freedom to measure the average return, the mean return, which is r bar here. That is not a that is not a true value. You have to approximate that. So which is why you have t minus one. So if statistics is not your forte, forte, then don't worry about it. It's, you just need to know this formula. Um, and then to calculate standard deviation, just square root of variance. So let's just uh, here just a quick numerical example. So I just say uh, we calculate the average return of S&P 500 to be five percent. So how would you then calculate um, the realized variance? So with a ten-year observation, one over ten minus one times each yearly outcome minus the average return for the period for the whole sample. Um, so then you get that. 0.042 and a standard deviation of volatility here is 20.5 percent remember the calculation here is just like a background knowledge that helps helps us understand a bigger picture which is what, what's the relationship between risk and return right so you just need to know these formulas the more important bit is what's after and um so here's a, I'll just give you a quick summary of tools for working with historical returns. Um, so this is probably something that is, is handy that you want to put, a, 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 you know, uh, besides uh, you in, during the final exam, right? It, should you have any question, come up with any question that requires you to calculate real return, you know, it's right here. Oh, all right. So here's a weekly game trivia. Um, I completely forgot even though I made this slide a few few days ago. Um, so this company launched its IPO, initial public offering in April 2018. What is so special about this IPO? So you may know that spot, and that is um, that is probably one of the uh, the most frequently used app on my phone, Spotify, right? So Spotify launched its app IPO in April 2018, two years ago. What is so special about this IPO? I mean, what is so special about IPO in general? I mean, I, you know the IPO is initial public offering, is the company want to raise additional capital by issuing more shares, new shares to the public, get the public to become its shareholders, and in exchange, the shareholders will inject cash, uh, equity into this company, capitals, and that's how companies, that's what essentially what IPO does, right? Company want to get more capital, issue more new shares, sell to the public, and the public become new share become new shareholders in the company right so what's so special about spotify um i think it's covering the next figure yeah and um spotify will skip a lot of ipo essentials so uh, in a nutshell what what what's so special about uh about spotify's ipo is that 
during its IPO process, it actually didn't issue any shares, any new shares. Instead, it actually sells existing one, which is kind of like in contrary to what people you know, expect to what happened in IPO process is that the company need money, right? It, it actually needs money for the company. That's why you want to issue more shares to the public in exchange to get more capitals. But why is that the case, right? Is you can read more about it in Google more, given that most people um, use Spotify, you can find out, find, find out about what happened to Spotify. And that becomes a new trend now. All right, back to risk and return. So this, okay, so the previous, previous slides shows you calculating the expected, uh, the realized return for S&P, small stock, corporate bond, and treasury bills. And I just say, uh, you know, assuming that you know how to calculate realized volatility, which we show you, but assuming that you did, you did that, right? Assuming that you, you did that, um, you get a number. So the return volatility during the window, say, is 39.2% for small stocks, 20.3% for corporate bonds, uh, sorry, for S&P 500, 7% for corporate bonds, and 3.1% for treasury bills. And then alongside with it is the excess return. Um, in finance, we talk about excess return a lot. So, so excess return means, means this, means that, you know, uh, means the return I generate on top of what I could already ob obtain from treasury bills. So which means given the treasury bills had a, um, had a, uh, what was the number? So treasury bills, let's just say here's the treasury bills. Treasury bills return is 3.6%. So that gives me the absolute benchmark. So which means that when, when I'm thinking about excess return, the idea is that let's say if, if a stock can give me 5%, I would say the excess return is 1.4%. Why? Because I can get 3.6% from treasury bills. And that one is no risk. You should at least do as good as treasury bills, right? Given that you have risk. So in this case, if you calculate the excess return, which just means it's a return minus treasury bills return, then what we have number here is 15.1% for small stocks, 8.1% for S&P, 3% for corporate bonds, 0% for treasury bills because it's, uh, it's, it's the return of treasury bills minus return of treasury bills, 0%. That's the benchmark, right? So, and then you plot it. Okay, let's just say, let's say one day someone, someone was bored and they do this calculation when they had the data from 1926 to 2011. So, okay, if you, if you then plot the volatility or historical standard deviation, yearly, yearly observation on the x-axis, on the y-axis, they plot the historical average, average return. So here is the average return, no excess return, but it doesn't make, doesn't make a difference because it's just gonna be minus treasury bills. So just say if you plot the returns over standard deviation in such way, what do you observe? You note that there's a positive relationship between volatility or standard deviation and the average returns for large portfolios. So these are all portfolios. Treasury bills are portfolios, corporate bonds are a portfolio of investing different corporate bonds, and S&P 500 will be a portfolio investing 500 different companies, and the position and composition changes every now and then, right? And so it's same small stock, that's just a portfolio of small stocks. All these are synthetic portfolios. Not saying, not saying anyone actually has done this, but just saying on a theoretical basis, if you actually were holding this portfolio, what kind of return and standard deviation would you generate based on the observed values? So what you have here is that there is a positive relationship between that. So which means we now establish based on empirical finding, a positive relationship between volatility and average returns for large portfolios. The, all these are keywords, right? Policy relationship between standard deviation, volatility, and average return for large portfolios. We haven't mentioned about what the word risk here yet, but given that we believe it's high risk, high return, low risk, re low return, that probably gives us some confidence to call volatility as risk because there is a positive relationship here, right? But these are for large portfolios. Portfolio means you have more than one, more than one asset, more than one asset in your, uh, in, in your holding, right? So, but the, but the question then can be extended to say, is there a positive relationship between volatility and average returns for individual stocks? 
let's just show you the slide first. So here, uh, we show you what we show you here is that on top of the graph that we had before, which is the positive relationship between average return and the volatility amount, treasury bills, corporate bonds, portfolios, and small stock and stuff. We then plot out the same for 500 individual stocks underlying the S&P 500 portfolio. And we're using straight different color and, uh, and symbols to represent. So the yellow triangle tells you is the biggest 50 stocks. And the, the blue diamond is between, if you rank them, rank, rank them amount of market cap, right? Rank them, they'll be between 51 to 400. And the small uh, yellow circle is 401 to 500, right? So what do you see here over here? Can you still say there is a positive relationship between risk and return? If we were using risk as measured by volatility. Probably not. Why? Okay, let's just take let's just take that one as an example. Let's just say take that guy, right? Take this this triangle over here, just take take you. Alright, we can zoom in. We can say, let's take you as an example. So this company had about, on average, ha had about 27 or 28 percent standard deviation during the sam in a sample, and had about 5 percent return, right, on average. Can you do a better job to find someone, someone who has the same volatility but higher return? Oh yeah, I mean, if you look, uh, if you look above, all this company uh, forming this line. All these companies generate high return, but had a similar risk, similar standard deviation. Alternatively, you can also think about comparing that, that, that triangle with this blue diamond over here. So what you can say between that, so the blue diamond over here, it actually has lower volatility, but high return than that yellow triangle. So which means of, which means that positive, rela positive linear relationship is only valid for large portfolios, but not so much for small stocks. Because here the relationship can be upward sloping, can be a straight line, can be downward sloping. We're not sure, right? You probably have a wrong regression. But over here, what you can say for sure is that visually, visually it doesn't really present you a very convincing evidence that there is a positive relationship between average return and volatility. So which means there is no precise relationship between volatility and average return for individual stocks. Larger stocks tend to have lower volatility than small stocks. All stocks tend to have higher risk and lower returns than large portfolios and risk averse investors want the highest possible return for a given level of risk. So in this case, what I'm showing over here is that if we were using volatility or standard deviation as a measure for risk, it can, it can describe a relationship uh, between risk and return for large portfolios, but not so much for individual stocks. So which means now, if we want to say there's a, there's a positive relationship between risk and return, then we have to redefine how we measure risk for individual company. All right, so when while volatility seems to explain return for large portfolio, it appears unrelated. So you could say, okay, why is the S&P 500 so much less risky than individual stocks? And why is the worst stocks portfolio even less risky than the S&P 500? So over here, if you look at S&P 500 over here, that one, generate lower return than some of the stocks over here, but generate higher returns than about half of that, right? Because it's, it's, it's weighted, um, it's valuated. But it's, it, it, has low, it has a lower risk than pretty much any companies over here in this region. Why is that the case? You probably have already heard the term that don't put all your eggs in one basket what you call diversification, right? Because just in case, if you drop the basket, you lose all your eggs, right? So that's an old saying, Any, everyone should, you know, should, should know about, don't put all your eggs in one basket. But when I used to teach my students about, about that, you know, when don't put all your eggs in one basket, if everyone believes that 
Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Then what would you do? Then what should you do as a finance student over here? Well, what I'm going to say is probably going to be, uh, hopefully it's going to open, you know, open your mind. But if everyone believes in finance, if everyone believes don't put all your eggs in one basket is correct, then what you should do here is to invent more baskets to sell to people, right? This is actually what, you know, what sales people are doing. They provide all these financial services. They provide you new ways of to invest. They provide you new ways to diversify. So which means that if everyone believes you should, you should get more basket to put your eggs in, then what you should do here, well, you know, of, of course, one part of that is to follow the wisdom that is to, to, to put your eggs into various different baskets. But as an alternative, you should sell more basket. You should invent more basket for people to sell. All right, but that's diversification. So now we're gonna introduce something called, uh, so this is, this is now going to our last section of the day, which is probably one of the longest one, one of the longer one, is to, to talk about firm specific risk and systematic risk, such that we're introducing this, by introducing this, we're able to establish our aim, our goal is to establish a positive relationship between risk and return and that relationship even holds on an individual company's level, right? This is our goal. So now we're introducing something called firm specific risk and systematic risk. So systematic risk is, is a risk that affects all securities, every single company, every single asset, and is a risk that is perfectly correlated because we are all hit by the same event and news that affect our stocks such as news about the economy um in the past years when i was trying to say the systematic risk i used to give an example such that you know like re-election in us or election year in in australia but you know the election in australia turned out to be not causing too much of a stir um, but you know this year we have COVID-19 that's a perfect example of systematic risk you can see that that has affect every single person and has affect all stocks in comparison we also have something called firm specific risk which is a risk that only affects a particular security and is a risk that is uncorrelated or independent from each other so you can think about the good or bad news about an individual company. You can think about, let's just say, if you are a drug company, you come up with a new drug, new um, new vaccine for a particular, uh, for say, for COVID-19, that would be a good news for that company. That was probably not gonna, not necessarily gonna be a good news for some for something else, but in this case, COVID-19 is gonna have a positive impact on, on anyone. But just say, um, say let's just say uh, the CEO of a company had a car accident. Right, that's really just specific for that company, right? It will it will have no impact on another company that's not related to that company at all, right? So that will be a firm specific risk, and all these are just a you can think about the abstract concept. We, we, of course, we can't really quantify systematic risk. We can't we can't be hundred percent confident to tell you the systematic risk of this company is X, the firm specific risk is Y. But all these are just just built on conceptual level, we're saying there are two components in a company, systematic risk and firm specific risk. And diversification, the, the idea of diversification or the goal of diversification is to averaging out of the independent risk in a large portfolio, such that when you're holding say 20 stocks in your portfolio, the likely impact coming from you know, let's say for company A, the CEO just, you know, the CEO just fired a personal bankruptcy or the CEO had a car accident, that kind of, that kind of event would have a minimal impact to your overall portfolio because that turned out to be an independent event. The likelihood of company A CEO had a car crash would be say, would lead to zero increase in the likelihood of company B CEOs having car accident, right? So which means that kind of tend, tend to be independent event, which means by, by diversification, by diversifying to different basket, different portfolios, it would average out its independent risk. And in finance, we turn out, we turn out to be um, like naming stuff that, you know, coming up with different names for the same thing. So for firm specific risk, there are many other terms for it. 
um, the, t the you know one, uh, the one is sort of like very academic terms, idiosyncratic risk. And um, if you're talking to any finance finance academics, they like that term, idiosyncratic. Because that make make them sophisticated, right? Idiosync idiosyncratic risk, unique risk, unsystematic risk, diversifiable risk. Uh, but I, personally, I like I prefer to call it firm specific risk because that is quite self-explanatory. It's specific to a firm. And that, that's, the, that's the risk component can be averaged out and can be diversified. In comparison, there is a systematic risk that is cannot be diversified out. And the other names attached to it will be undiversifiable risk, which also makes sense because that's not diversifiable. But people like call it systematic risk or common risk or market risk, right? So my pre personal preference goes to call uh, the first one firm specific. The second one systematic risk. Right. So now we've introduced the concept called firm specific risk and systematic risk. Just to show you the overall picture is that um, here, what we have here is that we have total risk that can be uh, decomposed into two components. The first one is firm specific risk. The second one is systematic risk. And we have seen that at the portfolio level, where you're holding a large portfolio level, empirically, we see that uh, high risk, oops, using a green, that we see a positive relationship between um, risk and return. And that risk was measured by sigma, or standard deviation of volatility, right, of variance. But we don't see such a relationship between volatility and return in um, individual company level. For individual company, we don't see such a relationship. We don't, right? So there isn't a relationship between total risk or the volatility. It just means no relationship, right? So, so Conceptually, what, we, what we're trying to, trying to show you here is that we want to decompose risk such that we are able to find a positive relationship between risk and return, but in this case, we have to redefine our risk into, as a spoiler alert, systematic risk. So we will show you that it's a systematic risk that matters. So it's a systematic risk that gives you a positive relationship between risk and return on the individual level, and we're going to call that we haven't introduced that just yet. We're gonna call that beta as uh, beta for systematic risk. All right, but we haven't we haven't actually introduced that yet. Let's just give you a quick overview. So, so how do we understand the firm specific versus systematic risk? Let's just say consider two types of firms. Um, this is this can be abstract to some people, but I just say we have a type S firms. So type S firms are only affected by systematic risk. Let's just say here in this, uh, in this example, let's just say there's a 50% chance the economy will be strong and type S stocks will earn a return of 40%, 50% chance the economy will be weak and the return will be minus 20%, right? And because all these firms face the same systematic risk, holding a large portfolio of type S firms will not diversify the risk. It's just like, if I buy one BHP share, and and if if everything goes up, BHP goes up by five percent. Everything goes down by, uh, everything goes down. BHP goes down by three percent. But you know, by by buying another BHP share, will not diversify my existing BHP shares because they will co move together. So this is the so this the idea for this kind of type S firm here. So in this economy, that a type S firm is the one that will be moving together with the economy. Right, and all these firms. Let's say for all these firms that are facing the same systematic risk, then if I'm holding a large portfolio of them, will not diversify the risk out at all because they will co-move together all the time. In contrast, we have type I firms. So type I firms here, I stands for idiosyncratic, which is also firm specific. So type I firms are only affected by firm specific risk. 
their returns are equally likely to be either 35% or minus 25% based on factors that are specific to their local market. Because these risks are very firm specific, which means that it doesn't come from the economy, it's coming from the firm itself. And if we're holding a portfolio of the stocks of many, many type I firms, the risk if it's diversified. So just to show, to prove you the concept in a, in a statistical term, so let's just say over here, what is the volatility of the average return if we hold 10 type S firms? And what is the volatility of the average return if we hold 10 type I firms? As a background knowledge, if everything is independent within a portfolio, let's say if all investments are independent, means that there's no correlation between each other, so um, then the variance of the portfolio will be the variance of the individual one divided by n, such that the standard deviation will be the standard deviation of the individual asset divided by n power to 0 0.5, because you take a square root. So in this case, um, to answer this question, type S firms have equally likely returns of either 40 or minus 20. So the expected return is 50% chance, because equally likely, times 40% plus 50% chance times minus 20%, that gives you 10%. And with this, uh, and with this 10%, I can then plug into the variance formula. So here, I know that it's 50% chance gonna hit 40%. So we'll be using the variance formula, a half times the return minus expected return square, plus half, which is another probability, times minus 20, minus 10%. That's the expected return square. So the standard deviation of RS is 30%. And because all, all type S firms have high and low risk low returns at the same time, so that means the average return of 10 of type S firms is also 40% and minus 20%. Just think, just think about this. If I buy one, uh, one BHP share, that would give me the same uh, average return for me to buy 10 uh, BHP shares, right? Because they're not different from each other. So in this case, um, the, 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 so that means you, when you're holding the portfolio, it has the volatility of 30%. And for type I firms, I can calculate the, the back return as 5% here, and, but its standard deviation in this case will be, so for, for, for the individual asset, the standard deviation will be, again, using the variance formula, uh, probability 50% chance times 0 0.35, the uppercase minus the average return 5%, Square plus a half times minus 25% as down case minus 5% the, av the, av the expected return square. So the standard deviation of that is 30%. But because they are independent, which means in one scenario it could be one of them goes up, the other one goes down, the other one goes up, the other one goes down, because they're independent, right? Unlike type S firms, they move together according to a common factor. In this case, type I firms are independent. And using what we know for statistics, if they are independent, then holding 10 of them will reduce my standard deviation of, of my portfolio. In this case, will reduce down to 9.5%. So if you plot them together, so what you have here is that um, if you, so, that, so let's say if we focus on the blue line over here, it shows you that, uh, so it doesn't really matter how many type S firms you're holding, your volatility of the, of the portfolio will be the same as the individual company, right? 30% here. But for type I firms, the one that's only affected by firm-specific risk, the more you're holding, the, the portfolio, volati portfolio volatility would drop by a factor of square root of n, right? This is because it, as we can see from the calculation over here, the portfolio volatility equals to the individual volatility divided by square root of n. So the more you're holding, the lower the number we will be, right? The lower the number you will be. But of course, we don't actually have type S firms in the real life, and we don't have type I firms in real life. And in, in real life, every single firm is a combination of the two. So which means, doesn't matter what company, what industry you're operating in, there will be a sensitivity to the market, uh, market wide news, and there will be a segment that contributed to the firm specific, which means that, if we are holding a typical firm in the industry, in, 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 in real life, then it's gonna be somewhere in between. So, and this figure isn't exact. 
we don't know what that, what that exactly is because we don't actually know what type S and type I firm is. But let's say here at a conceptual level, we know that the extreme case will be either type S, that means everyone co-move together, or type I, that no one's moved close to each other, everyone's independent. So that means because in real life, every single thing, every single company has, uh, you know, is, is affected by either, uh, by both idiosyncratic, firm specific, as well as systematic, then that means a combination of that will be somewhere in between. And this one shows you the benefit of diversification is, is that when, I, when, I, when, when I'm holding more shares in my underlying portfolio, I'm trying to diversify out the idiosyncratic, which is why it slow goes down, because the more I'm holding, the more likely that I will have companies in my portfolio who does not move uh, the same direction as the other one, right? Such that I, will, I can achieve something called diversification benefit, and this benefit coming from a reduction in the firm specific risk. And, and the next two slides is probably, uh, I will say it's probably difficult for someone to grasp, grasp at this in the first go, but I will give it a try anyway, right? If you're not sure, re-watch re it or re-read these slides again. So let's just say consider the type I firms, the one at idiosyncratic firms. Should an investor get a risk premium for taking on the unsystematic risk? Which means that should an investor get a risk premium that higher than the risk per A for taking, should I get any bonus from taking this unsystematic risk? So here's the logic, here's, here's the argument. If the diversifiable risk of stocks were compensated with an additional risk premium, then investor could buy the stocks and diversify out this extra component to eliminate risk and earn the additional premium making an arbitrage profit. But because investors can eliminate a firm specific risk for free by diversifying the portfolios, which means, let's just say, I can reduce the, the standard deviation of my portfolio by simply taking another company that who doesn't co-move with my existing companies. That means that is a risk reduction, but coming from no extra cost. So which means, it should not require or earn any reward or risk premium for holding it. So which means that when I, you know, so, so which means that the the unsystematic risk component of my shares should not be rewarded. And here is a very important conclusion: that the risk premium for diversifiable risk is zero. So investors are not compensated for holding firm specific risk. So which means, in other words, when I'm holding, when I'm buying a company, when I'm buying a share, by buying a stock, and I observe the standard deviation is very high, very risky, but you know, but I, I, you know, I would only be, I should only be rewarded for the component that is that is non-diversifiable, that is related to the systematic part of of. Of the uh, of the risk component, because let's just say, should I be uh, should I be should I be rewarded that the company has a high chance or a lower chance that the CEO has a car crash? That's very firm specific. Probably not because I can diversify that risk out by holding another company that is not related to that event, right? So such that if that risk can be reduced without any without any cost, then that risk should not be rewarded, and that's the whole idea that no reward should be compensated, sorry, no reward should be given to unsystematic risk because they are diversifiable, because they can be reduced without any cost. They can be reduced by just simply holding another stock that has different distribution, that is independent, that is less related to, less correlated with this, com with this company. So, which then takes us to a very important conclusion, which is, the risk premium, which means what, what is the reward that, that, that should be awarded when you're holding the risk. The risk premium of a security is determined by a systematic risk and does not depend on its diversifiable risk because diversifiable risk can be reduced by holding another asset. This implies that a stock's volatility, which is the measure of total risk, is not especially useful in determining the risk premium that investors can earn. 
So which means the standard deviation, which is the measure of total risk, is not an appropriate measure of risk for individual security. And there should be no clear relationship between volatility and average returns for individual securities. And consequently, to estimate a, a security's expected return, we need to find a measure of a security's systematic risk. So remember this graph that we just talked about? In this case, sigma of volatility is used to proxy for total risk. And we observe that there is a positive relationship between total risk and return. There is a relationship between volatility and return, right? But, it, but that such relationship doesn't hold for the company level. So which means on a conceptual level, we, I mean, it's, again, none of this is precise, right? We decompose total risk into firm specific and systematic risk. And, we, and, we, and we're showing that on a conceptual level that systematic risk should be the one that gives you a positive relationship between risk and return on a company level. And all that is used to, in, to explain what we see here. This is just, you know, is a, is, a, is a subject that based on empirical findings and trying to find interpretations to explain what we observe empirically. So back to this graph, you see that when we're using return and standard deviation, volatility to measure risk and return, uh, you know, uh, respectively, we see a positive relationship uh, for portfolios. But we don't see that for individual companies. Then we have to come up with an explanation, a framework such that what we observe makes sense. So the, the, the framework that we come up is that total risk can be decomposed, which total risk is the standard deviation, your total movement, total dispersion, can be decomposed into two components, systematic and firm specific. So when you're holding a portfolio, a portfolio will have many different assets underlying, so which, means, which means that when you're holding a portfolio, you can diversify out the unsystematic risk such that when you, when you diversify the, the systematic risk, then your total risk component is just left with systematic risk, right? Which is why we observe this positive relationship for the, for the portfolio level, because, for, because the portfolio would have a very small firm-specific risk component to it. And down to the individual company level, we were trying to find a frame, we're trying to find the same relationship between risk and return. And in this case, if we use standard deviation to match the risk, it doesn't work. So which means that it's a systematic risk that that will establish a rela positive relationship between risk and return, right? So all that, all this, all we have introduced is trying to explain, trying to explain what we observe. So, uh, so now if we, so now we can estimating the expected return. So which means what we expect to see in the future. So that means expect, so expected return will require to measure the investment systematic risk. And then we need to determine the risk premium required to compensate for that amount of systematic risk, right? So measuring systematic risk. So how do we measure systematic risk? Um, we don't have a precise answer. And all these are just assumptions, right? So we're just saying, you know, vaguely or very, in a very abstract way, we, we know total risk can be decomposed into two components, but we can't actually precisely quantify that. So if you, if you have a doubt, if you, if you, let's say, if you watch the video up until now, you say, I'm very confused, but that's fine, right? We're, we're trying to introduce you a framework that many of them are still remain unanswered, even today, right? Let's just say, let's say today, if you, let's just say if you tell the world saying, I have found a precise way to 100% quantify a company's systematic risk and is 100% accurate, then guess what? Congratulations, you will win a Nobel Prize. Because there, will, there have been Nobel Prize awarded for people who have tried, right? So if you think this is confusing, if you think this is not clear, it's, per, it's perfectly normal, right? Perfectly normal. So just bear that in mind. So let's just, so it's just, 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 just have an open, uh, you know, just, just be open-minded. For now, let's just say, just, let's just assume all this can be true. Doesn't, it, it is not true, but it can be true. So to measure the systematic risk of a stock, we can determine how much of the variability of its return is due to systematic risk versus unsystematic risk. And to determine how sensitive a stock is to systematic risk, 
we can look at the average change return for about for each 1% change in the return of a portfolio that fluctuates solely due to systematic risk. Right, which again, that's just defined on a conceptual level. And a portfolio that only contains, contains only systematic risk is called an efficient portfolio. And there's no way to reduce the volatility of the portfolio without lowering its expected return. So here it gives a definition of what you mean by efficient. So when someone's saying, when someone's telling you, uh, I have an efficient portfolio, that just means it's a portfolio that contains only systematic risk and all the firm specific risk has been, has been diversified out. And there's no way for me to reduce my risk in this case, or, well, or volatility in this case, there's no way to reduce the volatility without lowering its expected return. And in this framework, we can introduce something called a market portfolio. A market portfolio is an efficient portfolio that contains all shares and securities in the market. And in US, we usually call the S&P 500, the find the largest. In Australia, we have ASX 200. So all these sh all these stock market portfolios, these stock market indices, is often used as a proxy for the market portfolio. Um, and um, in Australia, we have ASX 200, I uh, just talked about, or all lot, or ordinary index. And then we just call, call beta. Beta, beta here, is a measure of a systematic risk. It's defined as the expected percentage change in the excess return of a security for 1% change in the excess return of the market portfolio. And beta differs from volatility. So volatility measures total risk, systematic plus unsystematic, but the beta is a measure of only systematic risk. You can think about a securities beta is related to how sensitive its underlying revenues and cash flows are to general economic conditions. So like stocks in cyclical industries are likely to be more sensitive to systematic risk and have higher betas than stocks in less sensitive industries, right? Um, so here you can think about, well, if you compare uh, Telstra, which is 0.3731, the beta, that just tells you that um, if you're comparing Telstra and um, say BHP, BHP has a high beta. That just means that it's more sensitive for how good the market is. Because when, when we say we are in a good market, in good economy condition, that means there's a huge supply, a huge demand from for the uh, iron, of iron ores from China. Uh, and that's, all, that's gonna be a positive sign for the Australian economy as a general. And that would be a better news for BHP. But in comparison, because Telstra has most of his, most of his revenue is coming from domestic, providing telecommunication service, selling phones, selling phone plans, and all that. And that, that turned out to be an industry that doesn't, you know, isn't, isn't too much fluctuated or affected by the overall market condition comparing to BHP. And um, so you could say, you know, so so that means in this case, the higher the beta, the higher the systematic risk component, and lower the beta, the lower the systematic risk. We will talk about how exactly to, to quantify beta in our next lecture. But let's just say, give, let's just say here that we have a rough idea that beta is, is what? The beta measures the expected percentage change in the access return of a security for a 1% change in the access return of the market portfolio. That's the definition for now, right? So here, let's introduce another concept called market risk premium. The market risk premium is the market risk premium is the award that investors expect to earn for holding a portfolio with a beta of one. So in this case, you can think about is the market risk premium is what you get from the market in excess of, of what you can earn from the risk free return. So which means, let's say, if by holding the market portfolio, S&P 500, I get 10% return, and the risk free is say 3%, then my market risk premium is 7%. And, and, and if you're holding a portfolio that is cold moves with the market portfolio 100%, we're saying that that would be, that portfolio would have a beta of one because you move exactly the same. And if you, if you have a beta of 1.5, that just means for every 1% movement in the, mar in the market, you have about 1.5 times that. So which means, in this case, we can estimate a security's expected return from its beta based on this. 
based on, well, my expected return, it's gonna be based on, I need to at least earn risk-free interest rate plus the premium that I'm holding. Because risk-free interest rate is a return that you generate from no risk. So which means when I raise capital for my investors, one way to do it is that well, I can just simply put the money into the bank at risk-free interest rate, right? So that means that is at least the benchmark people want to want me to compare with. And then I plus the risk premium part. And the risk premium part is from holding the risk and it's from holding the systematic risk, which is a factor of beta. Remember beta measures systematic risk. So if you think about beta is like a unit of risk, that means if my beta is two, that means I'm holding two units of risk. And for each beta one, so for each, uh, for each unit of risk, I get a market risk premium. That means if I'm holding two risk units, I should get twice of the market risk premium. And that's the idea, right? So this one tells you that that's one way for you to conceptually measure the expected return of this asset, which is based on you should get a risk free, right? That's the benchmark. Plus a risky, uh, like a risk return trade off of here, beta is used to measure the, the, the risky component multiplied by what is the reward you would get. For every single unit of systematic risk that you're holding, you will get a market risk premium. And that is a Nobel Prize winning uh, uh, formula, which is what we're gonna discuss next week again, capital asset pricing model. So in fact, in week 11, we're gonna re-derive the same formula using another framework. But this week, we're trying to come in from a risk return uh, framework to tell you that here, I know that if I have higher risk, I will get higher return. So which means I have a rough idea is that which if I have three units of risk, I should have a higher return than something gonna has gonna holding two units of risk, right? And that's just a rough idea. And the, the rest is just to say, okay, how am I gonna apply this formula? And applying this formula is very straightforward. So let's just say here, assuming the economy has a 60% chance, the market return will be 15% next year. 40% chance the market return will be 5% next year. Assume the risk-free interest rate is 6%. And if Microsoft's beta is 1.18, what is expected return next year? So in this case, let's first calculate the market return. So the market return, expected return is gonna be 60% times 15 plus 40% times 5%. That gives you 11%. And using the formula that we learned from the previous slide, ER, which for the individual asset, ER, equals to risk-free plus the beta times the market risk premium. So this whole item over here, this item is the market risk premium. Premium coming from like an access and market is the ER market. That's which is what I call market risk premium. So if the market risk premium here, if just the formula over here, important formula, market risk premium. Um, so in this case, plug all the numbers in, you get that uh, ER equals 6% plus 1.18 times 11% minus 6%. And that tells you the expected return of, of Microsoft equals to 11.9% in this case. And what if that what if that doesn't hold? Let's just say, well, let's say if you if you if you then compare the Microsoft's in performance next year, if it turns out to be a different number, then can you say this formula is wrong? Well, you could say this formula is wrong, but it could also be that some people the, the, so the defenders may also say maybe it's the wrong way for the calculator beta. Right, and maybe you didn't measure the market return correctly. So in this case, you can say this about joint, joint. No, I wouldn't say it's joint hypothesis, but in this case, there are so many things can go wrong. But at least you you can for for now at this stage, you can think about this is what viewed like uh, this. This is a I mean this is a concept that gives you a good intuition to explain what you observe in empirically. Right, so. That tells you the higher the beta, given that it's a positive relationship, the higher the beta, the higher the return for the individual company, right? So a firm's cost of capital for a project is expected return that investor could earn on the other investment with the same risk. And we, we, we just talked about systematic risk determines expected returns. So the cost of capital for an investment, it's expected to return the valuable on security with the same beta. 
So which means the cost of capital in this case, or let's say when you're going, going back to the capital budgeting uh, week, last week, when you're trying to evaluate the return in, in, in a discount rate, and the discount rate can be calculated through this, that the expected return or the cost of capital here is equals to the risk rate plus the beta of my project times the market risk premium. And this equation, as I said before, is often referred to as the capital asset pricing model. And I would say it's probably the single most important method for estimating the cost of capital that's used in practice. And guess how often it is correct? Less than 50%. So that is saying, if you flip a coin, the single bell, okay, have I, is that a number bigger than the, or smaller than the actual return, than the actual return that we're gonna get? Well, you could say it's probably less accurate than flipping a coin. But why do, but why do people learn it then? I mean, why would someone got a Nobel Prize for that? Well, it, because it provides a framework that makes sense and that you can build your own extension into it. And this is why we started this first, such that later on in finance, you can learn a more advanced model of that to, to probably better explain the, uh, the empirical observation. So next week, we're gonna learn portfolio theory, and that is the last topic for the whole unit. And we will re-derive this capital asset pricing model form using a different framework. All right, I'll talk to you next Monday.